Okay, we need an amen from someone. Thank you. That was beautiful. Have you ever experienced a lack of hospitality? Uh, I was thinking back and remembered a dinner that uh, Pierre, my husband, and I were invited to. Uh, it was years ago at our church in California. And uh, Pace was a baby, so I was a nursing mom. And we were kind of excited about this dinner because this couple had a rep. the husband, I think, had a reputation of being like a really gourmet chef. So we were kind of excited about the dinner. We didn't know them really well. And they asked us to arrive at four, which we did. We thought, okay, that's a little early for dinner. And so we arrived at four and we arrived hungry because we knew the food would be fabulous and, you know, wanted to be ready for it. And so we arrive at four and like there's no, there's nothing out. Like there's no appetizers, there's nothing. There's like, I couldn't find a chip to save my life. And I look back on it now and I should have said, we're a little hungry. Do you have a little something we can munch on while we wait for dinner? Because I think it was two, two hours before we had dinner and they wanted to show us their house and they wanted to hold the baby, and I'm like ready to tear their eyes out. And we don't remember the meal. I'm sure it was fabulous. We remember being hungry for, for two hours, right? At hospitality. I, and I married into a family, so this is a, uh, the Lyons family I married into at holidays. I remember thinking, there's so much food. We would go to his aunt's house for Thanksgiving in Los Angeles, like all this food. Well, they had like mac and cheese pans, like the size of a football stadium. And it's because everybody took home enough to feed their family for another week. Like they had all this food because they wanted to send you home with food. I mean, that's the welcome and the, the hospitality that I married into. And lack of hospitality leaves a mark, doesn't it? it? It's something we remember when it doesn't happen. Today's parable by Jesus is about hospitality. It's been interpreted in many ways, but I want to present to you, even before hearing it, that it's really about one thing, the welcome and hospitality of the kingdom of God. It's another really short parable Jesus, uh, Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches symbol of welcome. So one of the scholars I'm reading is the, uh, the Jewish scholar of the New Testament, A.B. Jill Levine, and she literally outlines all the possible ways in the history of the New Testament that this verse has been interpreted, and there are many. So let me just give you a little rundown of the, the different interpretations of the mustard seed. Uh, number one, the smallness of the seed suggests the miraculous growth of the kingdom of God, whether in our hearts, in the church, or in society. Okay. Number two, it represents the growth of the church. And she notes, this was very popular in the 19th century when the church was actually growing in North America. Number three, the small seed leads to universal redemption for all people. And the birds of the heavens or the birds of the air represent the Gentile nations that take shelter in the boughs of the church. Okay. Number four. The metaphor of a small beginning to a large ending is about eternal life. The body is sown as a seed in death and then is transformed into something grand. Number five. And now the things take like a weird turn, but these are out there, these interpretations. 
Number five, the mustard seed is a dangerous and noxious weed that seeks to take over and destroy the garden. I'm like, shake my head. Uh, and the garden could be uh, Judaism or the Roman Empire or anything that really doesn't jive with the kingdom of God. Number six, the birds are a warning somehow to the upper class who live off the toil and hardship of the poor and the, the cultivators of the garden. Number seven, the kingdom of God depicted as a weed shows that God's kingdom doesn't come with a bang and defeat of the Roman Empire, but as a small and insignificant weed in the garden. And there's a few more possibilities that were just so out there, I'm not even going to share them. So Amy Jill Levine in her commentary, there's almost an eye roll. Like her, her, her writing is actually kind of clever and funny. You could almost hear her in her words, like give an eye roll to all these different interpretations. And she essentially says this, it's a small seed that creates a home for the birds. That's the parable. It's about welcome. It's about hospitality. It's about providing a safe place, a home. Small beginnings, big results, and impact. Now, just a small aside, because some of these interpretations called the mustard uh, plant a weed, but it, was, it, it grew wild, so it could be a wild sort of weedy type thing out in nature, but it was also grown in gardens. And Pliny, who was a first century naturalist, writes about its medicinal qualities. Now, the doctors among us may disagree. Um, uh, Pliny writes, it is helpful for snake and scorpion bites, indigestion, toothache, asthma, epilepsy, lethargy, tetanus, leprosores, and yes, constipation. So, you know, the interpretations about the weed taking over and destroying the garden, you know, Dr. Levine is like, no, that's really not what's going on. It's about this tiny seed that creates this amazing home for the birds. It's about hospitality. So many of you know, I'm just going to show you this. Many of you know my oldest son, Steve, is now a tattoo artist. And he's still in the apprentice stage of his work. But he does beautiful work. And if you haven't seen my tattoo, I require you to get to see it first. My tattoo comes from this verse. Sometimes people look at it and say, oh, the tree of life, you know, from, from the story of creation. It's not the tree of life. It's the tree that comes from the mustard seed. I was never a person that thought I would probably ever get a tattoo, but when your son becomes a tattoo artist, you, you know, you kind of have to. And so I thought, what would I want permanently on my body. You know, it has to have some kind of meaning. And because welcome and hospitality is so important uh, in my family and for my faith, I chose this tree because this is the tree that becomes the tree of welcome. And now it's on me forever as a reminder that that's one of the highest values in my life is to, to provide that kind of welcome both in my home and in the church I serve. Um, you know, churches don't always get this. How many of you have walked into an unfriendly church, right, where no one has greeted you? You know, it happens. Um, <clears throat> I remember years ago uh, sitting in with a hospitality committee to plan a church dinner, and there was a woman on the committee who literally was saying things like this. Oh, we, we're trying to plan this beautiful event. Oh, we don't need dessert. People don't need dessert. And that was, we don't, we don't need centerpieces. I mean, it's so much work, and then you have to clean it up. We don't really need tablecloth. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And I was like tearing my hair out. I'm like, are you trying to rob this event of all its joy? Because in my mind, we need more dessert. You know, we need crazy centerpieces. We want people to walk in the room and, and feel like we're ready for them, and that the meal is beautiful, and that it's going to meet their every need. Uh, and I love what's happening with the poinsettia tea. Anna Lee Noble is leading the charge. 
because that's what they're doing at the tea this year, this Christmas event that's been dormant since the pandemic started. But individual women are going to claim a table and then decorate it and use their china and do some beautiful decor. So this is an event that captures this idea of the more extravagant end of hospitality, you know, the big tree with the beautiful table. I love that. It should feel that way when people walk in here. When they walk into this room, it should feel warm and welcoming, like we are putting out the best china every Sunday morning. I was recently at a lecture and uh, our presbytery kind of hosted an event a couple months ago and uh, uh, Roger Nishioka, who used to be a professor at Columbia, Columbia Seminary, gave a message. Mike was there and Francis. But do you remember he talked about uh, a survey that was recently done by another professor at Columbia Seminary? And the survey was about what brings people back to a church. If you visit a church one time, what is it that brings you back? And what he discovered that it was not the music Sorry, it wasn't the music. <laughs> but it wasn't the preaching. It wasn't the beautiful building or even the theology. It wasn't if the pastor gave them a call the week after they came. The number one thing that brought people back to a church was the warmth of the congregation. Literally, whether someone in the pew in front of you turned around and greeted you and initiated a conversation, the number one thing that brings people back to a church is hospitality and welcome. So if all y'all want to get a tree tattooed on your back to remind you of this, I know someone <laughs> who can do that. Hospitality, a small action a tiny seed can have a huge impact when it grows and flourishes. The birds of the heaven came and took shelter in its branches. It was safe. It was big. They liked it there. Small origins, big results. When uh, we were in Spokane, I learned something interesting about the city. And this is a story about hospitality. So in December of this past year, um, a group of homeless people set up camp in front of the city hall in Spokane uh, to protest the lack of homeless services. There were zero beds at that time. Like there were no beds for anyone anywhere. And the city was in a habit of doing, um, what do they call them, sweeps. So the people that had found shelter in aqueducts or found cozy little places out of the weather, and when, when the government sweeps, they, they take everything. So all these people, their bus tokens, even their IDs, just the little things they have collected to live by just gets confiscated. And so this, this homeless camp, and it was called Camp Hope, set up probably 100 people in front of City Hall to just protest the, the city and their lack of services. Um, and the city was like, oh no, <laughs> we're not standing for this. And so they started threatening to do a sweep of the camp. And so this group of people decided, and it was sort of with the aid of some local agencies. They're like, you can disband or you can move together to just a safer location. And that's what they decided to do. So this group of homeless moved to a little piece of land a few miles down from downtown Spokane that happened to be owned by the State Department of Transportation. So you have the city and the state happening here. And the Department of Transportation literally became the tree. They welcomed the, this homeless camp onto their land. Uh, they brought out pallets so people could kind of make, you know, little structures and have their own little area. It grew this summer to 600 people. It's now down maybe to about 450. I've been researching this since I found out about it. Um, 
a lot of people have kind of found other housing or gotten jobs and have moved out of camp, but think of 450 people in a camp. So they, they, the Department of Transportation actually put up a fence as protection, you know, not as a jail thing, but really to help protect them. And then local community services have been coming in to try and work with the homeless people there and provide services. And the, so it's the state that's providing the welcome and the city is not happy about it. The city of Spokane feels like it's the state's problem and they need to deal with it. And the state is like, this is our problem. It's our issue. We need to figure this out together. So it's been in the news like every day up in Spokane. It's really contentious. But here's what Pierre and I experienced when we were up there for our friends Dwayne's memorial, memorial service. We took an Uber to and from the funeral. Each Uber driver brought up the homeless camp. They were extremely chatty Uber drivers, and I happened to be in the front seat for whatever reason. So I'm in the front seat, and the first Uber driver was kind of a young guy, and he was really chatty, and he brings up the homeless camp. There's this homeless camp, and we didn't really know what it was at that point. There's this homeless camp, and then he started railing on the homeless. You know, they want to be homeless. They don't even want help. They just want to be homeless. And like, it was me and Pierre and his sister and her husband, and we, they got really quiet. And I was like, I'm not going to argue with an Uber driver about the complexity of homelessness, right? And so I just said, I said, yeah, wow. I said, yeah, it's a, it's a really complex issue. And I, and I kind of shut it down. He wanted that camp cleaned out and gone. Well, the Uber driver on the way back was an older woman and oh my gosh, she was a she was a smoker, and the car like we got in the car, it was, and I was in the front where the ashtray was. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, it was just really overwhelming. And she was also very chatty, and so she was just chatting, but she was lovely. She was chatting, 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 and talking about you know being an Uber driver. And she brought up the homeless camp. I'm like, this is crazy. And she, and but her reference to the homeless camp was, oh, you know, there's that big homeless camp outside of town. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time taking meals out there. I was like, ah, oh, how interesting. And so we talked a little bit about the service that she takes. I thought, isn't that the world? Right here. We experienced it in two little Uber drives, right? Lack of hospitality, hospitality. And I want to take this outside of politics. Right? There was a lot of politics going on in Spokane about this homeless camp. But as people of faith, what's our call? Our call is to be the tree, right? It doesn't matter why someone's homeless. It, it doesn't matter. It, it just doesn't matter. We are called to be a place of welcome and hospitality. And I'm telling you right now, I would rather go with my smoking lady friend to feed the homeless than spend any time with that first Uber driver that just had no, wanted no truck with people who wanted to be homeless. From a tiny seed can grow a giant tree. It, it's the image that something small can have a huge impact. So it is, it's our call to be the tree wherever we are, how we greet people, how we interact, how we serve. It should all stem from this desire to, to welcome, to embrace, to care for. We don't know anything about the birds, where they're from, what they do, the damage they cause in the world, where they poop, you know, doesn't matter. The birds were welcome in the tree. The kingdom of God is like that seed that becomes a tree that welcomes the birds. This is what God's kingdom is like. And this is our calling to live as citizens of that kingdom. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we want to be better. We really want to do better, God. 
create in us a tiny seed of welcome. And Lord, help it to grow because we know you can. Help it to grow so that our whole lives embrace the values of your kingdom. Through Christ we pray. Amen.